Members of the Gaming Commission, thank you for letting me appear before you today via the miracle of Lottery TV. I've struggled with different ways to provide you with my comments on the topic of New York's history with race day medication. I spent years, too many years, in a comparable position to you at the former Racing and Wagering Board. Nothing is more excruciating than sitting on a panel at a public hearing listening to someone read his or her written testimony, especially when they're on tape like me and you can't question them or cut them off. However, since I'm no longer on the receiving line of this testimony, and since turnabout is fair play, I thought it would only be poetic justice if I could spend the next 40 minutes slowly reciting my report verbatim together with all the accompanying footnotes. In the alternative, I thought I might combine this presentation with my demo tape for the potential future pilot of Food Network's Chopped Racetrack Edition. So commissioners, I have prepared for you today a composition on race day medication usage and drug testing in New York State, largely layered on the issues presented by phenylbutazone and furosemide in a melange of history and questions lightly seasoned by a soupçon of jocularity. The report is dedicated to the memory of my father, who never met an Oscar Barrera claimed horse he couldn't bet on. Should I be fortunate to win this contest, the proceeds will surely be donated to a foundation which funds the college education of needy children of former racing commissioners from Slingerlands, New York. Seriously, I've written a briefing on race day medication in New York focusing on butin Lasix. The history is intermingled with the history of New York drug testing. I've also provided a suggested list of questions and issues for you. The issues and questions are far from exhaustive. I know you will read the briefing. I won't read it to you. This is not at all an advocacy piece. It makes no recommendations and takes no policy positions, but it is designed to provide the commissioners with some historical background on these particular equine drug issues and how they've affected the regulation of New York paramutual racing. With that, however, let me suggest 10 considerations that might help guide your deliberations. These considerations are obviously my subjective views of the issue and can only be blamed on me. One, over the last century, drug usage has never not been an issue at the racetrack. Assuming there was a golden age in racing, for much of the 20th century, drugs were always present. There were certain times, especially the early 1930s, when powerful narcotics were in regular use. In 1974, Alfred Gwynne Vanderbilt, then the chairman of Naira, could say, I think what has happened as we went through a lax period when you could give a horse something and not get caught. Two, there really hasn't been a time in the last century when drug testing was up to the challenge of detecting new drugs. Just like generals who are always fighting the last war, we're always pursuing the drugs of yesterday and missing the drugs of today. Three, racing's policy on race day medication has always been inconsistent and almost never rational. Initial policy has almost always been driven by whatever seemed to be the popular policy of the moment. And not surprisingly, initial policy choices once enacted have proven most difficult to alter. Four, you can't consider race day medication in New York as being simply a thoroughbred question. The state holds more than twice as many harness races as thoroughbred races. You need to consider the experience of harness racing as a major component of what you're doing here. What has been the effect of Lasix on harness horse performance? What has been the effect on overall harness horse health and durability? What effect has Lasix use had on harness breeding? Five. The Hippocratic Oath is fully applicable to the work of racing commissioners. The admonition, first, do no harm, applies to everything that racing commissioners do. You may think that given racing's current diminished status in the sports world, that you have a mandate for immediate action. Maybe. But I think the conventional wisdom is that racing commissions on their own have an infinite capacity to make even a bad situation worse. 
If you act, you have to act thoughtfully and precisely. And please, do no harm. Six, don't think that New York acting by itself will change much of anything. We spent close to a decade in the 1980s and 1990s when New York held steady as the only United States jurisdiction banning race day Lasix. We solved nothing. No one was inspired by the hay, oats, and water example of the racing and wagering board. No one said, if New York State can race without Lasix, then we can race without Lasix. Instead, we at the Racing and Wagering Board were considered outcasts and misfits. At best, we were considered dinosaurs. You need to act in unison with other commissions. Seven, uniformity among racing commissions is a worthwhile idea that should be eminently doable. Some of the problems caused by lack of uniformity may be overstated. We don't see too many positives called because trainers made an error in understanding the rules of the jurisdiction they were about to race in. The notion that uniformity is needed because of the new interstate nature of racing is similarly overstated. Harness horses have always barnstormed across the country. Thoroughbred horses have often raced in a multitude of jurisdictions, especially in the years before states initiated 12-month-long racing circuits. Seabiscuit ran in 10 jurisdictions in the 1930s. Whirl Away ran in nine jurisdictions in the 1940s. Instead, the problem of uniformity is for the fans. They now bet on races in every state. They need a consistent product. They need to know the rules are the same everywhere. I have a pet peeve that the rules on disqualifications of racehorses should be the same everywhere, and I can never figure out why this uniformity cannot be achieved. Eight, the eminent handicapper Taylor Swift has repeatedly stated in the song Bad Blood that Band-Aids don't fix bullet holes. That applies foremost to drugs and racing. Whatever you think of race day medication, it is the Band-Aid. Our failure to catch state-of-the-art drugs and the intentional cheaters in racing is the bullet hole. Keep your eyes on the prize. Work to repair the bullet hole. Nine, there are two areas you need to focus on. The first is horse health. You need foremost to protect the health of the horse. You need to work your way through the issues and find out what works for the horse. Ten, finally, and perhaps most importantly, public policy in horse racing has to focus on the fan. It's not on state revenue. There is no state revenue from racing. Fans are the sports participants, and you need to be their representative. The state's interest should be the fan's interest, and it deserves your full commitment, not just an occasional rhetorical mention like I'm doing here today. If you want New York to prosper from racing, get fans to bet on racing. Talk to and work with the current and hopefully future fans of racing. You need a drug policy that makes sense to fans and comports with the fan's interest. I know you will read my briefing. I hope it's valuable. But if your eyes start to glaze over it, and that happens when you reach my age or that of Commissioner Poklemba. Just stick to my final two considerations. Focus on horse health and what fans want and need, and you will be doing the right thing. If you ever need any additional information on the issues covered by the report, please feel free to contact me, and I thank you for the opportunity to participate in this most valuable program.